Well, this was a little unexpected, because sitting on the bench here, beside my main Amiga setup, is another Amiga 1200. Although granted, this one has a bit of a tan. It's also not mine. Instead, another local Amiga enthusiast, he dropped this off to me, asking that I take a look at its floppy drive, because apparently it's not reading discs. I previously helped a guy that owns this by building him a new PSU. Well, I say that. It was one of those meanwhile jobs. I just bought a meanwhile PSU and stuck it into the case of his old Amiga PSU. But that got him up and running. And then, just the other night, he dropped me a message to say the floppy drive is no longer working. Would I mind taking a look at it? I don't mind trying to help out anyone. So let's see what we can do. The easiest way to test the floppy drive is to stick a floppy in it. This is my copy of Amiga Test Kit, but let's just be sure that this is still working. So we'll stick it into my main machine first. And yeah, that comes up fine. We can go into the floppy drive test. We can do a read test. As you can see, that completed fine with no errors. So at least we know that this disc is good. So let's see if it does anything on this 1200. It's trying to read it, but it isn't. And then it just boots to its CF card. So you can see there that DF0 is just coming up with four question marks. The Amiga cannot read that disc. In fact, I'm not actually sure if Amiga Test Kit if that can be read from disk within Workbench. Let me just try another one. Sysinfo, this definitely can. Nope, just bringing up exactly the same thing again. Definitely something wrong in here. So let's get it apart and take a look. So to take the 1200 apart, there are three screws on the front. And one either side. It's just clips along the back. One thing you need to be careful of though is that the screws on the front, well, they are shorter than the screws on the side. And if you were to accidentally put one of these longer screws into a position on the front, well, the screw would poke through the case and damage it. We will have to take those two screws out eventually to remove the floppy drive, but let's just take the top cover off for now. So you need to lift the keyboard up in order to disconnect that. That just lets us get the top cover out of the way. Disconnecting the keyboard itself is relatively straightforward where it connects to the motherboard here, that white thing. You sort of lift up the top of that. And then this should just pull out like that. And we can lift the keyboard out of the way. So there's the floppy drive that we need to take a look at. It is a Chinon model FZ354. We'll pull that out in a second. Obviously this guy is just running an 8 gig CF card, which is perfectly fine and more than enough storage for any Amiga 1200. And a fairly unmolested example of a machine, considering it still has its RF shielding in place and all the little tabs are intact so I dare say that has never been off. Is that a bit odd? The fact that it has two different ROM chips. This one's branded Commodore, this one's branded MX. I know certainly on both my machines they're both branded the same. I think one of them has Commodore ROMs in it, the other actually has MX ROMs in it. I dare say it's just one of those things and Commodore just lifted whatever ROMs happened to be in the bin beside them when assembling these things and that's what you got. Now there's one screw down in here which takes off this whole bracket. And then there's those two and the drive should just fall out. So we'll just remove this bracket. Just the one screw holding that. And it seems to be another flat 
bracket or something here on the bottom of it, like a cover on it here. Let's just pull that off as well. That's obviously protecting the motor. So as for breaking into this further, well this whole top half here, it should just be a couple of clips around it holding it in place. So the little flat screwdriver, let's see if I can get that off. There we are. The drive actually does look really clean inside, doesn't it? It's not that dusty looking. And just having a quick look at the heads, well, they don't look too bad either, to be honest. If we take these two screws out, I'm hoping that will take off this big bottom bit of metal as well and just reveal the drive, the frame of the drive and the PCBs. And there we are. The good thing about recording all of this is that at least I have a record of how it came apart. So one thing I'm just looking for here is the track zero sensor. Where's the sensor that identifies when this thing is back home? Because we really do not want to screw about with that. We really don't want to move that. If we do, that could spell game over for the drive or trying to repair it anyway, because you need specialist equipment to reset that. And I'm thinking that might be it up in there. So I'm not sure how well you can make that out on the camera or not, but I think that sort of black thing there, that is the track zero sensor sitting on this PCB, which while it may look like it's sitting at a bit of an awkward angle, you can see here that it has been glued in the factory. It's been set in this position, so we do not want to move that. But supposedly a weak point of these drives, given their age, is the capacitors. So we'll give it all a really good clean. We will clean the heads as well, and we'll swap out those caps. So it's just these three electrolytics. We have a 1 UF 50 volt, 100 UF 6.3 and 22 UF 16 volt. I have replacements here. Now they all are the same capacitance, although the voltage on these two is ever so slightly higher on my new caps, but that won't really matter. So we'll just do one of these on the camera. C26, we'll do that one, and that's between those two points there. Now my desoldering station is on the fritz. Well, the desoldering station itself, it's fine. It's the gun. I need a new one of those and I have ordered one. In fact, I've ordered quite a few things in the last lot of days, week or so, but with all the current postal strikes, well, God only knows when the stuff will arrive. So I'm going to try and just use a bit of wick to get the solder off. I definitely find if you're going to try and do it this way, adding that bit of fresh solder first, it really helps. That's one of them off. That is... 22 UF 16 volt. The only one I have to replace it with is a 22 UF but 25 volt. That should be fine though. As long as the capacitance is the same you can increase the voltage. But I just want to clean that a little bit first. You get an awful lot of flux or resin or something whatever it is off that desoldering braid. That's a bit better looking. Positive is the longer leg. And you can see positive is written on the PCB here. So that's one down. I will do the other two. And then we'll test it. 
Just before we do actually test it though, it would be worthwhile giving it a clean. Now granted it wasn't that dirty in the first place, but we will go over the heads anyway. And I know last time I did something like this, I used IPA on the heads to clean them. This stuff. And a few people complained that there's potential there for that to damage the heads. So instead, this time, let's use some actual head cleaning fluid. This actually came out of a floppy disk drive cleaning kit that I picked up ages ago from a charity shop, I think. Never been opened until now. I'm not going to use that disk though, I'm just going to use a cotton bud. In fact, let me get another one, there's a bit of dirt on that. I'm going to use a clean cotton bud and just put some of this on it. And then just nice and gently give the heads a bit of a tickle. But yeah, don't see any dirt on the tip of the cotton bud. Um, they looked pretty clean anyway, and it seems they were. No, I'm not going to paint it. Rather, we're going to go with a bit of white lithium grease just over the stepper motor here and on that rail down in there in which the, the sled that carries the head, the rail on which that travels. But this comes out of here at a million miles an hour, so I'm going to spray some on my mat and we'll just use that cotton bud again. Use that to spread it where we need it. Okay, I have it hooked up here, although it's still not fully back together, but it is assembled enough that we can test it. The Amiga is sitting ready, waiting for a disc. I can hear this thing clicking away. So let's see if we've fixed it. Certainly looks good. We'll go into our floppy test. Let's do a read test again. And yeah, all the tracks read fine. We can check the calibration test here. And again, that seems fine. We want this test to report 1111 each time, and that's what it's doing. Our floppy drive seems good. So it was just those capacitors all along. But speaking of capacitors, remember I said earlier that it looked as if this RF shield has never been out? Well, if this has never been out, then the caps on the Amiga's motherboard, they have never been changed. And as we all well know, that is a problem on these machines. So while this was left off to me purely to repair the floppy drive, I think it would be only right that we at least remove this top RF shield and take a look at those capacitors. There is these wee tabs around it, as I mentioned previously, but also two screws, one here that goes down through the case and one here that comes up from the underside. Well, now that I'm in, it's pretty obvious that someone has been in before. These metal tabs, there's supposed to be one here, but that was missing. And the one at this point just fell off as soon as I touched it. Looking at the capacitors though, well, I'm not sure if they're original or not. The likes of that one there, the solder point on it at the front here. That would almost make me think that has been redone, that that isn't factory. But when we go down to the other end of the board, well, the solder point there on the front of that capacitor, that definitely looks a bit dodgy. That looks as if that has corroded, but that is the only one. Everything else looks good. So having a quick chat with the guy who owns this Amiga, yes, it has never been recapped and he's asked if I could do it for him. No problem, I will get it done. But having a look through the capacitors, 
that I have in stock. Unfortunately, I am missing a couple. The other thing is that the soldering station, there only is four through-hole caps on this board, but I would definitely prefer to have that the soldering station up and running for those. You do need quite a lot of thermal mass to get uh, those caps desoldered. So the new gun for it is in the post to me. Now considering I have to order those other caps anyway, well, I think we'll leave the recap of this for another video. That is, of course, if you even want to see another Amiga 1200 recap video. I did do one quite a while ago on the channel, although I think it wouldn't do any harm to revisit it once again. But as for the purpose of this video, the main focus was that floppy drive, and we did get it fixed. Yes, that was just caps as well, but sometimes it is nice just to get a quick and easy solution to the problem. Swap those out and the drive came back to life. So that is it for now. If you want to see the recap video, please let me know in the comments down below. But if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a big thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG and I'll see you next time.